Thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope you're all well and that you and your family are safe and healthy and enjoying the summer as the best you can before we move on to the new school year. My name is Ying Gao. I'm the AP Chinese Education Director of Mandarin Playground. Um, Mandarin Playground is the host of this seminar today. So before we start, I would like to briefly introduce who we are and a little bit about our guest speakers today. Mandarin Playground is founded by Harvard graduates and offers Chinese language learning programs for three to 18 year old children who may or may not speak Chinese at home. We're based in Seattle and Shanghai. Mandarin Playground currently serves students over 10 countries globally, including the US, Canada, Australia, and some countries in Europe. We not only teach Chinese language arts and cultures, but also aspire to nurture intrinsic motivation, critical thinking, and global citizenship. We do this through our online and on-site courses and through hosting a series of Chinese language and culture related events for the general public. So today we're honored to invite Mr. Richard Sears, also known uh, Richard Sears, also known as Uncle Hanzi, to give us a talk on Chinese etymology. Speaking of the Chinese etymology, I would like to first start with a picture illustrated with Asian Chinese pictographs. So I would like to enjoy everyone to um, think actively to to, to um, try to see whether you can um, tell what the meanings of these pictographs are. Um, Xiaoshu Laoshi, would you mind to unmute our guests, uh, our, our participants for a little bit so that people, so that they could um, talk? So can anybody tell what this character is? It's something in the sky, right? It looks like the sun. And what else can we see? You saw it? Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I heard somebody saying, oh, right. right, we see trees and more trees and even more trees. And now we see, what is it? Tall. Yes, tall. We see grass. And here comes the horizon. And an animal. Turtle. Turtle. And a rabbit, right? So um, it's actually, it actually comes from a part of our online course materials. So it's part of a story. We try to use pictographs to tell a story. So can anybody tell me what this story is about? The, the tortoise and the hare? Yes, the tortoise and the hare is an Aesop's, Aesop's fable, right? So we'd be amazed to find the Chinese characters used oh. nowadays still resemble these simple pictographs invented thousands of years ago. For example, this is zhi, the sun, and mu, right, the tree or the wood, and lin, the wood, forest, sun, and we see part of the character cao, gui, which is the title, fu, the hair of the rabbit. Right? Yeah, so it sounds pretty simple and straightforward, right? Well, not really. So if you actually learn Chinese, you know that it's very challenging to familiarize yourself with all the characters as most of them have become so complex that they seem to have almost no apparent logic. So how have the Chinese characters developed throughout these thousands of years of history? Can we still find clues in its current forms nowadays? Is Chinese etymology helpful in the process of Chinese language acquisition? If you're intrigued by these questions, I'm sure you will find Mr. Richard Sears' lecture today very interesting and enlightening because he has been through the whole bafflement when he started learning Chinese himself. And more importantly, he has found answers. Mr. Sears is the founder of the first globally impactful website that serves as a reliable and rich resource if you want to understand the development of Chinese characters. He started his journey with the Chinese language back in the 1970s. He spent over a decade digitalizing more than 96,000 ancient Chinese character reforms based on archeological resources and encapsulated them on his website with the goal to explain the original forms of and the original logic 
behind each Chinese character. He has since then become an influential figure and foreign sinologist and has been invited to speak on many mainstream stages in China. I will now give the floor to Mr. Sears. Han Zi Shu Shu, welcome. Uh, thanks, uh, glad to be here. You can, can you hear me okay now? Yes, we could. Uh, good, well, I'm glad to be here and talk to people about uh, the origin of Chinese characters. Okay, I'll start uh, from the beginning here. Well, uh, dialogue with Chinese characters. That means I'm gonna tell a little bit about where some Chinese characters come from. And the first thing I always tell about is my golden rule. Every part of every Chinese character is derived from a pictograph. If you know the original pictograph, and you know the original meaning, then every Chinese character is logical. If you don't know the original character, if you don't know the original pictograph, then you are blindly memorizing Chinese characters and uh, it will be extremely difficult. Uh, the other thing that I tell students is how to be a good student, how to be a good scientist, First of all, never quite believe your teacher. Always assume your teacher or textbook is wrong. Then try to convince yourself that they are right. If you can convince yourself they are right, then they're probably right. Otherwise, go try to find the answer. In ancient times, uh, people had a very natural life and uh, one of the things in their life was various kinds of plants. And when people started to write, they would draw pictures of various kinds of plants and various other things that they found in their everyday life. Here are a few basic examples of uh, Chinese characters that come from plants. The one, one is a mu, which is a tree. In its modern form, it doesn't look much like a tree, but we will see how it is derived from a tree. Another character is he, which is grain. It also doesn't look like grain, but we will see how it comes from grain. Then we have two characters, che and cao. You will frequently see these characters as parts of other characters. They are actually come from pictures of grass. And then we have bamboo, chu, which you frequently see at the top of characters when the character has something to do with bamboo. And the last example is rice, me. Now, when you think about ancient Chinese characters, you want to think about how would you draw a picture of a tree? Not everybody thinks the same about a tree. I came from Oregon. And so when I think about a tree, I usually think of a pine tree, which is the first tree you see on top. It has kind of a triangular shape on top and it's stuck in the ground and it, you can't see its roots. If I was from Tennessee, and I thought about a tree. It might be a kind of fluffy tree, as you see with a round top. But if you're from China, you have a tree that looks like what you see on the left. So when I was studying Chinese, I asked, well, what kind of a tree is this? It doesn't look like a tree. But then I realized that in China, we have a kind of tree called a banyan tree and the roots are above ground. So you see this picture of a tree and the top part is actually the branches and the leaves, which would be green. And the bottom part is the roots, which are above ground. And so you can see them. So although it may not look like a tree, uh, once you know what it's supposed to be, then it does look like a tree. So keep thinking whenever you see the original pictures, if somebody shows you original picture, uh, 
what is it really? Uh, I have to think about these things. So you can combine parts. And what you see here is on the bottom, you see a tree. And on the top, you see something that looks like a hand. So you can combine parts and you come up with uh, a new character with a new meaning. In this case, it means to pick. So at the top, you see something. The top part is just a line and then three dots, but it actually comes from a hand, as you see below. So tsai means to pick. And under that, we have another character with a tree. And on top, it has something that looks like fruit. That's a character pronounced guo, and it means fruit. So every time, if you see the modern character, it doesn't look at all like fruit. But if you know where the pictograph of where it comes from, then it always is logical. Characters are formed in different ways. Some characters are formed from two different parts. Here we have the character by. It means a cedar tree. Uh, I should separate the A there. It means a cedar tree. And it has two parts. On the left, we have a mu, which means it's a tree of some kind. And on the right, we have a by. That tells us how it's pronounced. Many Chinese characters are of this type. They're called xing sheng zi. Part of them are, part of the character tells you what it means, and part of the character tells you how to pronounce it. Here we have another character derived from mu. It's pronounced bun. And in this kind of, <coughs> in this kind of character, you see that the mu, the tree, <clears throat> part, the bottom part has been augmented, it's been colored. So you know that this character has something to do with the roots. In fact, it's pronounced bun and it means a tree root. Another modification of tree is the character way, which means not yet. And if we think about a tree with flowers on it, with buds on it. A bud is something, is a flower that has not yet opened. So if we are ancient Chinese and we think of a bud, uh, we can think of, oh, it means something that has not happened yet. Another character that is derived from a tree is the character mo, which means the end of a tree. If we stand at the bottom of a tree and we look up to the top, we find that the top branches mean the end of the tree. So we have the, the word zomo, which means the end of the week or weekend. So all Chinese characters, all Chinese words eventually or originally come from pictographs and their meaning becomes more and more complex, more and more abstract until we finally get modern Chinese. In ancient times, people would work all day and usually at noontime, if it was too hot, they would want to rest. So how do you draw a picture of rest? You should always think about what it was like to live in ancient China. Uh, in ancient times, if you wanted to rest, you would go lay down under a tree where there was shade and where you didn't have to worry about the sun. So a, pic a picture of a tree and a man, that may represent shoshi, which means to rest. So there are several different types of characters. I've just mentioned four of them. One is a basic pictograph, which is just a basic picture of something like a tree. And the other is a compound pictograph, which is like the character for to rest, where you have two different things, a person and a tree. And 
A very common type of Chinese character is the pictographic uh, phonetics, where you have part of the character mean shows the meaning and part of the character shows the pronunciation. Then you also have the last type of character, which is a modified character. You have a simple pictograph or picture, and then you modify that character by maybe indicating a certain part of that character. And those are called modified characters. Here we have a pictograph of something. Usually when I teach pictographs, I color the pictographs, the parts of the pictographs, different colors. In ancient times, uh, Chinese would have to plant rice or grain and how do you draw a picture of grain? Well, the top of the rice or grain, it has a stalk which keeps growing out. And then when it leans over and it's ready to cut, then you have grain. So what you see here is a picture of something. It kind of looks like a tree, which indicates that it's a plant. But on top, we have the hanging grain. So this character is he. It's also part of many other characters. So if you learn the parts of the characters and what they mean, it's very helpful in figuring out what new characters mean. In ancient times, uh, most people were farmers. People lived simple lives and their life depended on being able to plant their crops and harvest their crops. In ancient times, we had what we call the biological year. People noticed that in a certain time of year called spring, the, everything would come out and get green. And in a certain time of year called summer, it would be very hot and things would grow and get better. Then in the fall, you had all kinds of things to eat. So you could harvest the grain, you could harvest the crops in the fall. Then in the winter, it got cold and everybody had to go inside and hide because it, you couldn't do anything. But this is a biological year and it was also the weather year. So in order to uh, draw a picture of this year, you had to draw a picture of something abstract. We could harvest the grain only once a year. And we have the word bringing in the sheaves. Uh, you often hear this if you're uh, reading the Bible. It means uh, to cut the grain and bring it in. But if we draw a picture of this, <clears throat> we can see the grain on top, huh, and a man on the bottom carrying the grain. And we can see how this character evolves over the years. Later, they added a line on the bottom. The line means one harvest, but it also came to mean one year <clears throat> because you only harvest the grain once a year. So in the first picture, you can see the grain and the man and the one. Then the picture, the pictograph gets more and more distorted. And finally, you have the modern character, which is the character for a year. It no longer means to harvest. But if you know where it comes from, then you can see each part of the character. And each part of the character comes from an original part of the pictograph. Now, what you see here is a nasty insect called a locust. It was very bad for the farmers in ancient times. If you're a child today, it's called a grasshopper and it's fun to play with. Many children like to play with grasshoppers and I wonder how many of you have eaten grasshoppers. These days, not many children eat grasshoppers, but in ancient times, people ate grasshoppers. And if you uh, come to China, 
you might still be able to find a restaurant where you can eat grasshoppers. They taste very good, but you have to cook them first. In ancient times, these grasshoppers, <clears throat> quiet dog. I have a dog here who gets alarmed when something happens. In ancient times, <clears throat> uh, these locusts or grasshoppers would go out of control. Uh, uh, in ancient times, sometimes these insects would get out of control and they'd eat the crops, which was very bad for the people because the people wanted to eat the crops. And they found that in the autumn, after the harvest, if they burned the crops, if they burned the fields, then it would also burn the insects and it would burn their eggs. So this was a time of year called autumn or the, the fall. In ancient times, they drew a picture of a fire on the bottom and an insect on the top. You can see how it looks like an insect and a fire on the bottom. Later, they changed it. They added a hu or grain. So that means it's the time of year where the fire burns the fields <clears throat> so you can kill the insect. The insect there, the grasshopper, the locusts, it was a bit complicated, so they wanted to simplify it. So they just threw it away and they ended up with a character which consisted of uh, grain and fire. And that's the modern character for uh, the fall or for autumn. <clears throat> now, in the past year, I've been involved in a project to make cards. Uh, we've made 128 cards and it uh, uses augmented reality, AR, and animation. And if you uh, get this product, you can use your cell phone, you can point to the card, and then you can, the card will tell you a story. Unfortunately, it's not working. You, you could, watch out, watch out. Oh, oh, okay, uh, okay. Uh, it is working. Uh, just watch. This is an animation. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Let me see. I mean, okay. Here's an animation. And Okay, this is in Chinese. You should insert. The video about shoe you didn't yes i did okay now let's try again okay the video is currently in chinese but you get the idea Chow Okay, currently our product has, uh, it's, it works in Chinese, but very soon it will work in English and, and you will be able to hear the story in English. <clears throat> Another uh, thing that uh, was important to the ancient Chinese was rice. Here you see the stalks of rice and you see the little uh, <clears throat> pieces of rice on the stock. And if you draw a picture of this, you see what you see on the top here is a picture of rice. And as it gets changed over the years, it, you want to write it quickly so it usually mm -hmm. gets simplified. And you see this mm -hmm. thing on the bottom, which is the modern character for mm -hmm. rice. <clears throat> it actually comes from a, pic, a pictograph of rice, as do all uh, Chinese characters. Uh, come from some kind of pictograph. 
So here we have another animation that shows how the ancient pictograph gets changed into the modern character. Mm-hmm. So before, if you just read a book and your look and your teacher just gave you the ancient character and the modern character, uh, sometimes people, the students would not think about how the ancient character actually gets changed into the modern character. But if you think about it, then you can see how it's actually the same character. I think that if you have this animation product, AR, you can just point your cell phone at the character and then get its story. And it makes it easier to see how the original pictograph gets changed into the modern character. So here's another couple of uh, ancient uh, simple pictographs. One is a sprout and it gets changed into a modern character, ch, which this modern character, ch, you won't see very often, but it's part of some characters. And it looks like a sprout. The second one looks like two sprouts and it gets changed into the character Cao, which means grass. <clears throat> but if you see this character on the top, this Cao, if you see it on the top of another character, it often means some kind of plant. It doesn't necessarily mean grass, but it means it usually means, uh, or in fact, it will always mean some kind of plant. Another character that comes from plants is sheng. Uh, sheng is uh, where the plant grows up. It sprouts out of the ground and it gets bigger and bigger. And so you see a picture uh, here of something that originally looks like chu, except you can see the ground on the bottom, the dirt on the bottom. And it gets changed so that you can see the two on the bottom. The two is a character for dirt. And it finally gets changed to the modern character for sheng, uh, which means basically to pop up, to be born, to grow up. And we have several different characters. Uh, we have shengming, which means life, and shenghuo, which means life. And uh, so this, uh, is very useful if you know and the modern character. If somebody asks you, what does it mean? You look at it, you couldn't tell what it mean, meant. But if you can see where it comes from, then you can see how it has meaning. And here's another animation of the character Sheng. So in the modern in the modern character, you can still see the parts if you have uh, seen where it originally comes from. So the product that we 
that I've been working on the past year is you have a bunch of cards and you can uh, point your cell phone at it and you can see their story. Here's another example where on the top you have the Cao and it's uh, the Chinese character Miao, which means sprouts in a field. You always want to think about when you study modern Chinese, you always want to think about what an ancient Chinese might be thinking, what the character might have meant 5,000 years ago. So from the very beginning, planting crops is the most important thing that people do. And it was very important how you planted the crops. You had to plant them at the right time in the right places. You had to give them enough water, but not too much water. And you had to give them the right kind of soil. So this was an art form. Notice I used the word art. So planting crops was an art. And here you see an original picture of a kneeling man with two hands and he is holding a plant of some kind, which would now be pronounced ch. The character gets made a little more complicated. They add some dirt to it at the bottom. That's the ancient character for uh, earth. And then the man who is kneeling there with two hands, it gets a little bit more simplified And we're talking now about the character, the ancient character for art, which was actually the ancient character for planting. Where uh, we see here the traditional form, this is a rather complicated example. And one of the reasons they simplified characters, this, is, this character is more complicated than the usual fantinza or traditional characters. It, they cut off the bottom part and they added a phonetic E so you knew how to pronounce it. <clears throat> but here is where it came from. It got more and more complicated. Notice that in the previous picture there was a kneeling man and there was a some dirt and there was a plant of some kind. Well the plant gets distorted so it doesn't look like a plant anymore. And the kneeling man, which I see here, you see here in black, it gets uh, more distorted, but you can see, you can still see his hands there. And then you have the dirt. Now in ancient times, when you planted crops, the weather was very important. If you planted crops in the winter time, they would not sprout. If you planted crops and the weather was bad, it would not sprout. So, you have in the traditional character, at the bottom you have a picture of a cloud. And the cloud indicates the weather. The weather was very important when you were planting crops. And on top, they added a cao, which as I mentioned earlier means grass, but if you see a cao on top, it means that it has something to do with plants. So you have the, in the traditional character, you have the remnants of the original man planting something in the earth and a cloud on the bottom that indicated that planting things required good weather and a saw on the top, which meant that you were planting some plants. Then it gets it got changed into its modern traditional form, which you see number in the number three. And then finally, when it got simplified, they decided that the bottom part was too complicated. So they just threw that away and put an E in there. That's a character is pronounced E. So now that's it's much more simplified uh, to, uh, to write. So we say art, yi shu, and we say gardening, yuan yi. Both of these come, and we have ji uh, shu, uh, which means skill. All of these come from 
something having to do with plant planting crops. So here we have a tau or grass or plants, and we have several different characters that come from uh, this plant radical. We have miao and sheng and hua and yi. Now we have another kind of plant, which is bamboo. And we see a picture here of bamboo leaves. And you can see an ancient a pictograph, which there's two of them. One of them just has a one piece of bamboo with a couple of leaves hanging off of it. The other has two pieces of bamboo with a couple of leaves hanging off of it. In bamboo, you have bamboo comes in pieces uh, of a certain length, and those pieces were called g. So now you have the modern character g, which only means one of, one of people. But you have the uh, next character, which is two pieces of bamboo. And you very frequently see this on top of uh, some characters. It means that it has something to do with bamboo. So let us think about bamboo. In ancient times, Chinese didn't have paper. In fact, Chinese invented paper but they invented it in the second century AD. So for the first few thousand years, they did not have paper. They would make strips of wood or bamboo and they would write characters on these strips. These characters, uh, the uh, strip, one strip of bamboo is called jian. That's where we get the word jian dan, which means simple. So, you see this character here and you see a bamboo on top. And you may think, well, what does simple have to do with bamboo? Or what does a scroll have to do with bamboo? The bottom part is a phonetic. And we'll look at that in a second. In ancient times, the people would work all day and then they would go home and they would rest. And they would go into the city and they would close the doors. Here you see a gate, mun. And in this pictograph, you have a pictograph of a gate, which is shut at night, and a pictograph of the moon, which indicates that it's nighttime. This character is a xian. It means the time to rest. And later, they changed the moon to a sun because when you, um, when you calculate the time, you need a sundial. So all of these characters, all, the, all of these Chinese characters are logical. If you consider the history <clears throat> and the original pictograph and the original meaning, all Chinese characters are logical. So here's a, a few things. When you look at Chinese characters like this character for chopsticks, uh, it's clear that you see a, a bamboo on the top and a phonetic on the bottom. And it's pretty clear that chopsticks are something that might be made out of bamboo. So some things are things that are made from bamboo. Those characters are fairly obvious, but some things are characters that it may not be obvious to the modern people that they are related to bamboo, but it would be obvious to an ancient Chinese because the ancient Chinese, they would write on bamboo scrolls. So uh, they would have to, uh, if you see a bamboo on top, it might have something to do with writing. In the Bottom characters, you see the second character is da, hui da the da. That means to answer. So what does answer have to do with bamboo? Well, in ancient times, if you answered someone, you would write the answer on a piece of bamboo called a jian, which means simple. And then you would send it to the person. It was sort of like a text message a text message from several thousand years ago. 
So in the second characters, you all of those characters have something to do with writing, but they wrote on bamboo. So you can think of where that logic comes from. In ancient times, they had a knife. And one of the things is the word sanshu, which means to erase. It has a knife in it. So what does a knife have to do with erasing? In ancient times, if you wrote something down, you had to write it on a gin or you had to write it on a piece of bamboo. And if you wanted to erase it, it was hard to erase. You would have to take a knife and you would erase it. So here we have uh, some, a picture of some ancient Chinese knives. And we have uh, the picture on the left is a picture that I made. The picture on the right is a picture of how, where, what the original Chinese knife probably looked like. Sometimes it's very difficult to figure out uh, for people who study ancient Chinese uh, what exactly the picture was supposed to be of. But if you look at this, the first picture is how I imagine the knife originally looked. And the second picture is uh, a pictograph of an actual ancient Chinese character. So you can see how it gets changed into the modern pictograph of a knife, Dao, which doesn't look anything like a knife, but it originally came from something that looks like a knife. So all Chinese characters are like this, if you can find their original pictographs. Why did I become Uncle Hans? Why did I uh, computerize 96,000 characters? The reason is that when I started studying Chinese, I would read books that told me where the Chinese characters were supposed to come from. But the more I thought about it, the more I found out, the more I realized that many of those stories were not true. And if I wrote, if I read two or three or four books, I might get two or three or four answers. And I realized that most of what you read is not true. And the reason I spent 20 years studying Chinese was to find the true stories. Usually if you find the true story, you can tell which ones are true and which ones aren't, but you have to think about it. You have to think about, did your teacher tell you the correct story? If she didn't, then what is the correct story? So that's how you become a scientist. That's how you become, uh, that's how you learn. You keep asking, is it true? Now in ancient times, we had uh, a type of musical instrument that was made of pieces of stone. It was called a ching. And the stone, in one case, it looks like this. They would hang a stone. The stones were of different sizes. They were usually made of jade. They were of different sizes and they would hang them and if you hit these stones, you would get a different tone. Here's an example of a Chinese petrophone. And these stones were carved. They, were, they went from small to large, and they were triangular shaped. If you hit them in different places, you would get a different tone, and you could make music out of it. So this is called a qing. Now we look at this character here. If we look at an ancient character, we sometimes see a <clears throat> what looks like a triangle. And originally that meant uh, a ching or a chime. And these chimes are made of stone. Remember that the chimes are made of stone. Sometimes we see a character that has a picture of a chime and it has a picture of a mouth. And these chimes, remember, they would make a sound. And so the mouth indicates that this is a stone that made a sound. So originally it meant uh, the qing, which is made of stone. And later it got simplified and more simplified into the modern character. Remember the qing was made of stone. 
So if you want to draw a picture of a stone, maybe if you just draw a picture of a Qing stone, then people will know that you mean any old stone. Uh, here's another example of uh, the card that uh, shows the animation and the development of the character for stone. Shi 就好像人能开口说话so here's a picture. I, uh, I'm a budding artist. I drew this picture uh, you see on the right of somebody hitting a stone and sound coming out of the stone. So maybe you can look at this picture and you can think about what the uh, picture means. You see a picture of a hanging uh, stone and a hand, the hand is red. It has something in it and it's hitting the stone. Then it gets changed and it gets more changed. The second character is a hand hitting a stone and so it makes a sound, sheng ying de sheng. So you have a combination of a hand hitting a stone, uh, makes a sound like a mouth, and you put an ear there and you can hear it and it gets changed and it gets changed into a modern, um, a modern character with an ear, sheng ying de sheng. And finally, when you want to simplify it, you don't need all that. Then you just end up with the modern simplified character for sheng, which if you trace it back, it's actually a stone chime hanging from a string. Now we have, in ancient times, people would also make uh, pottery. Here's, and we look at this word, this character, and we see, how do you draw a picture of dirt? You can't draw a picture of dirt. You have to draw something that represents dirt or that represents soil or land or clay. In ancient times, you had the potter and you had uh, clay on the potter's wheel, and that would represent earth or clay or dirt. So you can see how it gets changed from the ancient character that actually looks like clay on a potter's wheel to the modern character for tool. In ancient times, we used shells for money. And if you look at this character, you can see the ancient shell, and you can see how it gets changed into the modern character for bay. In ancient times, we had a boat, and we want to think about what the boat looked like and how it gets changed into the modern character Joe. And with this character, it's very useful. It's not just a boat uh, because it can be part of many other characters that have something to do with the boat. So you can see the boat on top and how this character is uh, derived from a boat. And we have a character for a car. Nowadays, a car has four wheels, but in the ancient times, we had a cart, which had two wheels, and it was drawn by 
uh, horses or cows. And you can see here the ancient character had uh, two wheels and the thing in front was actually cows or horses. And the horses go away. It gets changed to a traditional character, then a simplified character. <clears throat> and then we have a weapon. This is the last character for today because it's getting close to eight o'clock. Um, and this is, we end up with uh, something on the right, which is uh, pronounced G, and it usually indicates some sort of long handled tool. So that's the end of my talk today. And I think we have only a few, about five minutes left. And uh, let's see, I'll release this. Unshare it, I guess. Okay, can you hear me? Everybody here, here hears me? Okay, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Hello? Can you? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Yes. Okay, that leaves only uh, like a few, five more minutes if anybody has any questions. I have a question. Okay, what's your question? So basically, the, the good, the, why does it have to be like this weapon? Why can't it be like a sword or a bow or like something like that? Uh, we have many different Chinese characters. Uh, this is one Chinese weapon, but we have Chinese characters that are derived from a bow and an arrow and a spear. Uh, we have uh, lots of Chinese characters, not just this one. This is, usually people say this is a weapon and it makes several characters that are kinds of weapons, but it also is part of some characters that are just tools. So what you see here is only one character. It's, there are many oh, other characters. I know now, thank you. Ah. Uh um can i ask a question yeah yes uh when you were talking about um uh the chiu, um did you consider cicadas and crickets as the same thing it's the same species or oh well in ancient chinese characters if you look at something that was actually written in 5,000 years ago, you might have different types of insects, different types of snakes, different types of birds. Now we just have one word, now, which is a bird. But if you dig up something that was written 5,000 years ago, the birds would be different kinds. So what we have is the modern characters in ancient times, they may have been written differently and they may have represented different insects, but in the modern characters, it gets simplified and we don't really know uh, what, well, the language changes. So when we talk about one insect in modern Chinese, we usually have two or three characters. And so it's, if we look at a single character, we can't really usually tell what kind of insect it was. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, hello. hello. I have hello. a question. Um, okay. So what is your favorite or what's in your personal, what is, what do you think is the most interesting or uh, your personal favorite origin story of a modern character we see today? Well, people often ask me that question <clears throat> and I say, well, one character may be interesting, but you have to have all the characters. <clears throat> I mean, some, be some people ask, what is your favorite color? If you just say blue and everything was blue, the world would be very boring. So you have to have many different characters and some characters are more interesting than others, but there's lots of interesting characters. So I don't have one, <clears throat> one character that's most interesting. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah.
Lawson just um, raised his hand, so I think he might have a question. Lawson, I'm trying to unmute you, so you will, um, if you accept it, you can talk. Lo Chen. <clears throat> can you try to unmute yourself? He seems stuck for the moment. He'll come back to us. Oh, what, Jen? Oh, okay. Uh, I don't have any questions. I accidentally pressed that button. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, um, Hansi Shu Shu, I, I do have a question because I remember uh, during your presentation, you were saying that um, when you were reading, when you were consulting the books um, to find out the origin or deviation of the Chinese characters, you found oftentimes there were, um, their stories were untrue. So um, I, I want to know how can you tell or uh, based on what resources um, you feel like, so your understanding of the derivation, uh, derivation of the characters are true uh, versus um, the others resources are not reliable. And because um, this is well, uh, and, a massive resources um, about uh, the- in, in, in modern books, you have everything from pure garbage to maybe it's true, maybe it's not. And, uh, Chinese have been asking this question for a long time. The original dictionary was the Shouwen Jiezi and Xu Shen, he made a lot of guesses. He was right most of the time, but from archeology, span we know that he was wrong a lot of the time. Uh, but you have to think, we can't go back, we can't be absolutely sure, but we have to think, if I was an ancient Chinese, how would I write it? Is this, explanation uh, believable or not. And if we have two or three explanations, we have to think uh, which one is most believable. We have to use our logic. That's why I say, don't just believe your teacher. Think and ask if, you're, if your teacher, if, if it's true. And if, it's, if you don't think it's true, try to find something that is believable. So mainly I, I use, and sometimes I have discovered uh, many things by myself. I am constantly thinking, what would it be like to live in ancient China? And, uh, but then the other problem is that you have modern Chinese who just make up stuff, make up total garbage that has nothing to do with the character. And so you have to separate total garbage from people who have thought about it, but have the wrong answer to what might be the actual real answer. So it means you have to keep thinking about it and thank find you. your own answer. Yeah. Yes, thank you there. Thank you very much. I like it that you put, always put them, try to put it into perspective, put it into the context of the of Asian China, of the lives of Asian Chinese. I think that yeah. would help. Like um, your illustration of the tree, uh, was very interesting because um, when I was trying to teach the kids what a tree looks like, it also um, uh, it's a bit challenging at first because yeah, what, one what of the, the problems <laughs> one of the problems is like Shu Shen in the Shou Wen Jiezi, he explains rock or stone as as something that fell off of a cliff. Well, it doesn't sound logical, uh, but he did not know about the original picture. So you, I, I'm always thinking, okay, this doesn't look like a stone. This doesn't look like dirt. This doesn't look like a tree. So that, or this doesn't look like a bone. So I'm always asking me, well, it's a bone. What kind of a bone is it? What kind of a tree is it? So yeah, once you figure out what kind of a tree it is, then it's easier to teach. And uh, excuse me, can I ask a question with regarding the explanation for tree? Yes. Okay. And for tree, and I like your explanation, you know, referring that to a specific type of tree, which have, you know, the roots above the ground. On the other hand, often, you know, we try to look at from, you know, a tree, uh, 
the component of a tree uh, it include you know the above the ground the branches it also include the roots so i also remember i saw the explanation that with the mu it shows that a tree include you know the above ground side and also the underground side which is like the roofs which got nutrition from the soil and things like that that's another yeah explanation i'm not sure if that makes sense as yeah well. it's we, we cannot be sure of the original explanation but if i was an ancient chinese living in oregon and we only had pine trees i would not be drawing a picture of the roots because you can't see the roots uh, but if i was an ancient chinese living in if i was an ancient chinese living in yunnan i might see a banyan tree and it would be much easier to see the roots yeah i see that so, but we I, don't I, know, we don't know what the ancient chinese were actually thinking we can yeah. only guess i i agree with you i happen to be from yunnan myself Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, very interesting lecture. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thanks. I have a question. Okay. So basically, you like why go why? What is that? I mean, like, why do they have to draw a specific type of tree? How they just draw all different trees and then like. Well, you have to think <clears throat> if you're going to draw a picture of a tree, what kind, you know, it has to be some kind of tree. And oh. if you think tree, it could be a big tree, a little tree, a, a pine tree, a, an oak tree. Uh, you just want to draw a tree. You don't want to, you oh. know, so okay. depends on so, where you live. Oh. Also, you have to draw oh, some kind of what was that? <laughs> what? Okay. Go ahead. And then another problem you have is when people copy trees, you know, thousands of people copy the same tree and they copy it for hundreds of years, thousands of years, everybody thinks they're drawing something else. They may think they're drawing one thing, but they're actually drawing another thing. So <clears throat> it's complicated to try to figure out what the original picture might have been. Any other questions? Um, Hansi Shushu, we were just talking about your um, very useful and helpful website. Um, would you like to maybe introduce to us how we could best make use of your website? Uh, well, uh, my website is right now, it's got a, a lot of, if you put in any Chinese character, it will pretty much explain all the parts of the character and the origin of the character and the simplified traditional. <clears throat> I'm hoping to update it very soon. Right now it has a lot of information for each character and is maybe kind of hard to understand, uh, but I hope to be updating that uh, soon to make it a little easier to understand. Uh, when we simplify characters, usually most characters from the original pictographs to the traditional characters were a slow step-by-step -step process. So if you look at a traditional character, you can usually trace it back fairly easily. But when you simplify characters, many of the simplifications were quite illogical. If you don't know about the simplification, you can't possibly figure out where it came from. So the, simpli the simplified characters there's a whole story about how each character got simplified. And sometimes that's makes the character into a whole different character. Oh. Anyway, I'm going to try to make it easier to understand. I have another question. Um, hi. Um, hi, Shushu. I have another question about your website um, because um, 
you have showed your website in a very short time. I haven't recorded the name. Oh, um, you okay. show it again, and I will record it in my notebook. It's Hans Yen Dian Net. Uh, here, I there, there's two ways to get it. The old name is ChineseEtymology.org, but the new name you can go, you can use that one, or you can use the new name, which is Hans Yen Hans Yen Dian Net. H A N Z I Y U A N D N N E T. The new name. You can use the either name, name, but the, can 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 you speak the new name again? Uh, Hans Yuan Dian Net. H A N Z I Y U A N Dian N E T. Oh. So um, www.hanziyuan.at, right? Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, welcome. See the website. Any other Sorry. questions? Uh, Hans and Shusha, where can we see the, those very interesting uh, videos of yours? Because they were very visualized and helpful. Ah, good. I'll uh, I'll have just a minute. Leads it. They got seen the tempting. You want to get my get get them and kind of want more the DJ ma. Uh, Joe,明天就正式发布了，可以在微信公众号里面看到。Joe就正式发布了，可以在汉字书的微信公众号平台上面看到那个商城购购购买商城。Okay，购买链接。但是，嗯。Okay. Okay. 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 Uh, they want to see where they can get it. Where to get it? Yeah. On your WeChat. On my WeChat. On uh, okay, uh, WeChat yeah. public account. Oh, on my WeChat public, yes. They, they buy it, it just, just pass through you. Okay, yeah. It's fine. It's, it's fine if they buy it through you. Uh, you can on uh, what's it, Gita? Yes, yes. Yeah, you can. It, it will be much easier to operate yes um, send me a message we'll, and, uh, yeah, we'll we'll follow up after the talk after the lecture uh, in our wechat groups okay uh, okay any all uh, yeah i'll you can contact my um, wechat or contact me. Or contact uh, Lisa. Okay. Any Thank other you. questions? Xin Han also will also be available on our WeChat group to publish the Chinese Chinese related content. We hope you will be watching in the future. That's not a question. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Just to let everybody know that we're going to post the news for you and uh, the links. Yeah. Okay, good. Any other questions? No? Any other questions? I don't hear any questions. Maybe uh, can I can ask a quick question. Just I, I'm curious um, for this kind of um, sharing workshop, um, the way that you put it, um, how often are you going to plan to do the next one? I I don't know. I had no plans to do the next one, but if you want to do it. <laughs> All right. That, that's fair. Thank you. That's why we are going to have follow up for uh, Hansen Shushu's more information on the WeChat. I, I have, uh, I, have an, I, I have my own database other than my website. I have analyzed the top 15,000 Chinese characters and I have extracted about a thousand 
basic, modern, meaningful components. Uh, so if you want to hear more about them, we can have uh, quite a few, quite a few lectures. Sounds good. Thank you. Can't wait. Okay. Good. Any other questions? 你们这里有没有小朋友对汉字叔叔的字体感兴趣的呀? Is there any kids are interested in what Hanzushu has been uh, presented? We saw a few participants raising their hands. So if you want to talk, you can just unmute yourself. Like I think I saw Jimmy or Jackie. So if you want to ask a question or share your share some comments, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Jimmy? Is Jimmy here? It's very rare. Um, it's very rare um, situation that the uh, Hanzi Shuzhu can directly talk with us. So please, uh, Chen Xi, <laughs> please. Excuse this me. This opportunity. Mm -hmm. May I speak a question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you are speaking. We know that Chinese characters can be divided into six. Uh, um, yeah, you are speaking. The Chinese characters can be divided into six classes. That yes. Is xiang xin, zhi shi, yes. Xin sheng, yes. Hui yi, zhuan zhu, jia jie. So if yes. we talk about zhuan zhu and jia jie, yes. can we try to use your theory? Try to Try to immediately into some of the characters. Uh, well, actually, those the the six classifications of Chinese characters are actually a little bit simplified. Most characters can fit into that classification, but there are some characters, uh, quite a few characters, that don't easily fit into that classification, like ping pong, the ping and pong. Um, so, and there are many mm, characters that are somewhere in between. So it's actually more complicated than that, but most characters fit into one of those six classes fairly easily. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Do you guys think that we should wrap up? One last question. Um, how long have you, um, Hanzi Susu, learned all this Chinese? Um, how long ago? Just curious. Uh, well, I started learning Chinese. Basically, I studied physics. I'm a physicist. I started learning Chinese when I was 22, but I was not the best student. And by the time I was 40, I could speak Chinese, but I couldn't read or write it. So at age 40, I started learning to learning Chinese characters, but I found it very difficult because I'm a scientist and I don't want to blindly memorize So I started uh, a 30 year quest to try to find the real pictographic origins of Chinese. And uh, excuse me, and I have another follow-up question. And uh, I just wonder, you know, I really appreciate your interest and your you know, commitment trying to learn more about Chinese, Chinese character and share with us, including lots of, you know, Chinese culture inside. I also wonder if you have uh, read Shuo Wen Jie Zi. <laughs> I've computerized the entire show on Jiazi. Uh, okay. My website, I was the first person to computerize show on Jiazi. Uh, 
Okay, so, so I got it now. Yeah, so you are the, the, your system kind of like derived from that system, but you make it more vivid and also make it more. Well, Shouwen Jie Zhe is the oldest Chinese, oldest existing Chinese dictionary. So it's very important, but in recent years, we have discovered Chinese that predates the Shouwen Jie Zhe by thousands of years. And Shu Shen, he made a very uh, good attempt to try to understand Chinese characters, but he did not know about uh, Jia Guan and Jing Wen. So, I often refer to the Shouwen Jie Zhe as the Rosetta Stone of Chinese. If you don't, you have to start there, but then try to figure out what the real story was. Yeah, I hear that. Thank you. Yeah. It was very impressive uh, and encouraging story of yours. <laughs> I have uh, another uh, story. I computerized the Shouwen Jie Zhe in the 1990s. And I, and I hired a lady who, she only had a junior high education. But I taught her how to use the computer. And over a period of eight years, we uh, computered over, actually it was a one year or two years. But we computerized the Shouwen Jie Zhe. And by the time she was done, she was an expert in Zhuang Ti Zhe. And one of the college professors says, what qualification does she have? I said, she graduated from junior high, but she's computerized the, she has input the entire Shouwen Jie Zhe. So you don't have to have a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> experience counts it's true I agree and I also feel like sometimes we take things for granted because we are so familiar with the words we never really think you know inside and what that entails and I feel like as you from someone as an outsider but who has strong interest in Chinese language and culture you re you have really moved things forward which is you know something we really appreciate and admire thank you thanks okay. mm -hmm. we are very thankful for um, what you have brought to our culture to the thanks yes. thanks it's very impressive and um just I, I was curious, I was wondering, because um, I've been teaching students Chinese, um, adults, um, overseas students and young kids. So it, it's always, like you said, it's always very hard to, uh, sometimes the, uh, the development was lost. Um, I mean, the, the connection the characters have with what they originally means was lost because of the, the process of simplification. So what's your take on that? What do you um think because the students really appreciate it when you re especially for foreign students to when they're learning it it's really hard for them to write the traditional characters the simplified characters are much easier but it also lost many of the meanings so what's your take on that uh yes that's the uh, simplified characters are a huge loss uh and the other loss is the fact that we don't in many cases or in some cases we don't actually know the original origin of some characters. We know the, or we're pretty clear about the origin of most characters, but there still are unanswered questions. And it's also quite difficult to find, for most people, to find the actual origins. Um, I have another meeting I have to go to. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sears. Thank you, Hansa Shushu, for your time and your enthusiasm um, shared with us today. It's very enlightening. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you very Thanks much. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, those are very uh, some very interesting um, discussions. And I hope everyone has enjoyed the talk.
And I hope it has also aroused a great interest in our audience to learn more about the Chinese language. Um, I myself marveled at how our ancestors were able to use the pictographs to record and embody each of their meanings. So it feels like the picture has suddenly became a lot clearer when the dots are connected. But um, unfortunately, I was only led to such fascination as late as in college when I took the course of ancient Chinese while majoring um, teaching Chinese as a foreign language. So, because back in the days, road learning and repetition was still our primary strategy of studying in, in China. So yeah, um, yeah thank you, uh, Dr. Sears, for sharing for your sharing with us today. Um, um, well, now by I the way, to... I'm not a doctor. It's just my interest. <laughs> Yes, I, sorry. I, 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 <laughs> yes. All right. Um, so is it okay if I come back to my sharing, uh, share screen now? Yeah, I'll, I'm, I got to go to a meeting, so. Not a meeting. We have to the, go to the company. Yes. Okay. Okay. No worries. You can leave first. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And right. I, for the remaining audience, uh, we can stay for several minutes. Uh, and then, uh, Dr. Sorry, and let's go with the wrap up. Right. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, um, I think I, I, it's probably fair to assume that many of the participants today were brought up in China. And because we had remote learning and repetition as our main um, learning strategy, so as opposed to that method of teaching, um, I would like to say a few words about um, how Mandarin Playground uh, is, has um, developed our curriculum and our teaching approaches. So our curriculum starts with helping students get familiarized with pictographs through drawing at a very young age. And after the students have achieved a foundational knowledge of the Chinese language, we then move on to the elementary courses that are mapped onto the formal Chinese education system but adapted to the particular needs of ORC students. And our ultimate goal is to support students to master both Chinese language and culture. Students will be able to take the advanced placement Chinese language and culture exam starting from the ninth grade. And we expect our students to perform at an ex excellent level in this exam after years of studying with us. Um, so you, because I see our participants are um, between, uh, around the age of 10. So uh, maybe I could say a few more words about what is AP and why do we take the um, AP exams? Um, AP, AP means the College Board Advanced Placement Program. It enables students to take university level courses and exams while they're still in secondary school. And universities worldwide recognize AP in admissions and some even grant credits, which is very cost effective because given how expensive the college credits could be. And it also allows students to skip the equivalent course, which is the second year of college level, once they get into the college. So the next question would be, why would you choose Mandarin Playground for um, the AP courses? Um, the first and foremost, we have our, um, our advisor is, um, or our advanced placement Chinese curriculum has been developed by former members of the AP Chinese Culture and Language Exam Development Committee. So um, it's safe to say that um, our uh, College Board Advisor has helped us um, to know the essence or to know how the exam works and how to best assist our students um, with the most um, effective way in achieving their goal. And our rigorous, rigorous curriculum also reflects the core skills to be measured by the exam, as well as major themes specified in the course and exam description. Um, these are also very essential skills and themes that help students to use the language practically in real life and ensure that the students have a comprehensive understanding of the Chinese culture, which we as educators believe should be an integral part of the language learning process. And we also have very experienced teachers and dedicated professionals. Um, our teachers have been teaching Chinese AP, AP Chinese uh, with uh, more than for more than ten years. So they're very um, they have very rich experiences in this uh, in this field. Um, so they're also 
a few more um, things I would like to talk about, about our, our, our long online AP courses. Um, we have one-on-one -on -one live sessions and these courses are tailored to individual student needs. And uh, we use our online platform, which provides accessibility and saves the time for commute. And you can also book your, uh, book your class online and you have access to your homework online and uh, you can even review it. So it's very accessible. And um, anyone who's interested in this class uh, or in this course is welcome to contact us for a free trial class. Um, so we're gonna also share this information later after, the uh, after this uh, presentation today in our WeChat groups. So you can also scan our QR codes and, uh, or email us or contact us in the WeChat group. Thank you. Um, I could take the questions if anybody has some. Right. Dr. Su, would you like to add a few things, add something? My daughter, Supina, is the youngest participant of this meeting today. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I want to add that, like, uh, for people who ask about, like, how often are we going to host this kind of seminar? Um, actually, we plan to. <laughs> oh, sorry, maybe uh, Ms. Yao or any other one could speak a bit about our plan for the series of seminars that we are planning to host. Right. Um, actually, Mandarin Playground, ever since the foundation of uh, Mandarin Playground, we have been planning um, many kinds of our series of uh, e events for the, for the benefit of the general public, um, not only in Chinese culture, but also in, in the language arts or in various um, Chinese related arts, art forms. So um, starting from this um, fall, we're also going to continue to provide opportunities like this. And we're going to invite, after um, Mr. Sears, we're going to also invite um, a few major, um, very influential figures in this, uh, in the Chinese, uh, in the promotion of Chinese language and culture. I can add up, but uh, if you have anyone you would like to invite as a speaker, you think would be really beneficial for the community, please also reach out to us and then we will send the invitation. Right. All right, I think um, we'll wrap up for today and thank you everyone again for um, participating our lecture today. Um, uh, we hope you could stay um, following us <laughs> and we'll um, follow up with more information in our WeChat group and also um, on our WeChat account and YouTube channel. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Gao. And I thank you all of the co-hosts, especially Emily Chu um, and uh, Zhang Shu and uh, Simona. And uh, thank you for all of uh, the participants. And uh, may you have a good evening or good morning if you are from China, if you are in China. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.